I'm Shanali Basak, Wall Street correspondent for Bloomberg Television and Bloomberg News. I'm excited to be joined today by Michael Novogratz, the CEO of Galaxy Digital, and Dan Moorhead, the CEO of Pantera. Both of you have been a part of the traditional hedge fund industry for such a long time, and were really early adopters when it came to crypto. Help us think about how to look at crypto from a more macro perspective, as we're so worried about inflation, especially here in the U.S., and the calculus on interest rates is just not the same as it used to be. Dan, maybe you can get us started on the thinking. Sure. So, you know, Mike and I have been very bullish on crypto for eight years, but the response from the monetary authorities to the pandemic has been literally off the charts. Uh, and that's adding huge impetus to the value of things whose quantity can't be eased. And crypto is obviously one of the, the best performers. And then the easiest way to think about it is last June, the United States started printing more money each month than it did in the first 200 years of the country's existence. That's putting enormous pressure on everything, stocks, lumber, Bitcoin, Ethereum. And so from a macro perspective, this is a very clear uh, case of incredible amounts of money supply fueling inflation and things whose quantity can't be eased. Mike, do you have a way to think about this from a more macro perspective on where Bitcoin should be fitting into portfolios? Yeah, listen, I think, you know, both domestically here in the U.S. and, and globally, uh, you're seeing central banks and, and treasury departments, Ministry of Finance and, in some places, collude to print more and more money. And so you want to be long hard assets. So you've got hard assets, you know, real estate's a hard asset. Gold is a hard asset. Stocks can be hard assets and certainly crypto. And so I look at Bitcoin in particular as digital gold. And so if you're going to be long gold, Bitcoin's a better version because it's got the same macro tailwinds, but it's also very early in the adoption curve, right? People were scared of Bitcoin a few years ago. They moved into the the space and now hedge funds are okay with it. Real money managers are okay with it. Insurance companies are okay with it. And so you're playing an adoption game and you're playing a macro game. And so I'm still a big buyer of Bitcoin. Um, the rest of crypto is a giant venture bet, right? Ethereum and the Ethereum like tokens, DeFi, NFTs, all really part of a, a new future that's happening. And so that's a separate bet. It benefits from Bitcoin's tailwind. But it also benefits in that we're building this new architecture for the financial world that's going to be more egalitarian, more transparent, more efficient and more fair. And you can see Gen Z and millennials moving towards crypto, uh, but you can see the whole world now looking at it. Uh, I did a... I'm glad. I'm glad you already brought in, uh, and, and we'll get to that in a second too. I'm just really glad you brought in the definition of cryptocurrency here beyond Bitcoin, because everyone knows now generally what Bitcoin is. I think people are less familiar with the other tokens and the other ways that it's used. Dan, how are you trading it beyond Bitcoin? Yeah, it's a great point that for a long time, Bitcoin kind of was enough. It was the majority of the market. Uh, and so... Um, it really did approximate the industry. Now there are literally hundreds of tokens that are liquid enough to trade that have all kinds of different use cases. It might call Bitcoin digital gold. That's a great analog. Ethereum allows programmable money and then tokens to be built on top of Ethereum or Polkadot that allow decentralized finance and all these really cool applications that are coming. A really important way to think about it is <clears throat> if you're just long Bitcoin, it's kind of like in the 90s being just long Yahoo. You know, there were 30 other really important companies to invest in in the 90s. And the same here. There, there are a lot of different products to be invested in. And, and a good example would be this year, Bitcoin is up 34%. Our hedge fund that trades the liquid tokens is up 240%. So, you know, there's 180 percentage points of alpha in investing in things that aren't Bitcoin. What are some of those things before we get to Mike's paper here? <laughs> so obviously Ethereum is the second biggest. Uh, it's very important. It allows programmable money. You can do smart contracts, all kinds of really interesting things on it. Then, as Mike said, there are kind of newer versions of Ethereum. Uh, we're big investors in Polkadot, which is, a, is kind of a newer version of Ethereum. And then there's all kinds of tokens built on top of protocols like that. 
Um, like a, a cool one is Audius. It's a decentralized sound cloud. And it's a great way to show what the, the disruption that blockchain's bringing. It's taking these very expensive middlemen like Spotify or SoundCloud out of the middle and allowing consumers to interact directly with the producers of content and both sides get a much better experience. Mike, broaden the lens for us here. How are you trading beyond Bitcoin and what are you finding as far as uh, research goes into this broadening universe? I know you've recently hired a new head of research as you build Galaxy as well. Yeah, listen, it's, you know, for the general user of crypto, Bitcoin and Ethereum is probably enough. Uh, if you want to dig in and you want to become more professional or you want to you know, potentially have more money, a lot of the early stage venture bets. So we we have a venture fund. Dan's got a venture fund. Uh, you're, you're betting on these early protocols or then new tokens. Right. And so it takes homework. Uh, we're big buyers of the Luna ecosystem. There's a guy named Do Kwan. He's a Stanford grad from Korea who built a payments app originally called the Chai Payments app. We're now one out of eight. Payments, 8% of all payments in Korea are happening on Chai. The Chai payments app runs on the Terra blockchain. So Terra is a form of Ethereum. It's less decentralized, it's faster. Uh, and a lot of the value accrues to what's called the Luna token. And so it gets complicated for people, uh, but that's really where the frontier is. And so we've got big, big positions and lots of, of tokens like that. I would caution the the retail investor or the investor that's not diving in, you get a lot of that juice by playing on Ethereum. If Ethereum goes up, these other tokens are gonna go up. They might go up more if you get in early, uh, but it takes a lot more work to understand which ones to play. We're building a whole research team right. to try to give both institutional clients and at times all clients um, some guidance on what we think are the, the hot tokens. Crypto still lives on Twitter uh, and so you, can get a tremendous amount of information, good and bad, on Twitter. So you really need to curate who you listen to. Uh, it's very tribal as well, right? Each of these ecosystems has their own identity and it has their own um, sense, of, sense of purpose. You know, what Bitcoin did in a brilliant way is it made this idea of a community that gets around a, a digitally scarce asset viable. We used to have communities to get around assets like Picasso's, right? How many people do you think can buy a Picasso painting? There are probably 20,000 in the world that care about it. And there's, there's gallerists and dealers and, and museums that tell the Picasso story. And then people I best want to value start Mike, I want to start talking about kind of where this goes from here, because people look at DeFi, right, decentralized finance. And some say that it can really replace the banking system one day. Dan, I'd love your thoughts on this too, because do you think that there's a reality that this new ecosystem can replace the financial system as we know it? And if so, what time horizon does that happen on? I do think it'll build a parallel financial system. And if you think about it, all the other protocols of the internet, they revolutionized everything else in our lives, commerce, communication, all that. They really didn't touch finance. Banks are pretty much the same as they were. Credit card companies still charge what they did you know, decades ago. Uh, remittance companies still charge migrants a month's wages to send money back to their home countries. Those are all be changed by blockchain. And DeFi is one of the current applications that's really taking off. It's connecting borrowers and lenders without uh, an expensive bank in the middle. It's connecting people who want to sell an asset with people that want to buy an asset. And um, <clears throat> we've been investing in space for years and we're really excited that DeFi has gotten up to $60 billion of outstanding borrowing and lending. But to put that in perspective, there's a hundred trillion of bonds, right? So we're really at the beginning of what I think is a multi-decade trade here. Mike, maybe you can weigh in on your perspective here and balance it with maybe some of the major hiccups we've seen in the DeFi market. You see even really experienced investors like Mark Cuban trading tokens that are going to zero. Yeah, listen, you need to do your homework. So one of the things that's unique about DeFi is how fast it can build communities. You know, something like Bitcoin, it had tons of developers poking holes at it and poking holes at it and poking holes at it. And it really became a fortified piece of code 
uh, before it was ready for prime time. Some of these DeFi protocols show up and they haven't become uh, as vibrant, as, as, as resilient uh, because they're brand new. And so you've got to be careful on the brand new protocols that the coders, the community, right, this decentralized program actually works. Um, I think DeFi has got a big, big future. The big uh, thing that stopped institutions, even institutions like Galaxy from using it has been, do I know who's on the other side of a, of a smart contract, right? When I trade as a regulated entity, I need to, to know that who I'm trading with has been KYC, AML, right? That, that they're not a bad actor. And there's lots of protocols now that as soon as that, as soon as that uh, piece is fixed are gonna explode. And I would tell you, we are getting close ourselves at Galaxy from having a fix to that. There are lots of other people that are working on it. Imagine like a blue check at Twitter that I know, even though I don't know who I'm trading with, I know that they've been KYC by someone credible. And the moment that gets fixed, there's nothing left to regulate in DeFi. And so you're gonna see this peer-to-peer -peer exchanges, mm -hmm. peer-to-peer insurance companies, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, fixed income businesses really explode. And so I think if I was a bank, I'd be very, very focused. And I would tell you, I did a, I did a big presentation to one of the biggest banks in the world yesterday with their top 50 people at the bank just on this. They're thinking, how do we approach this? How do we get ourselves ready for it? Do we participate? Do we lobby against it? Uh, and so the next 12 months, you're going to hear a lot about DeFi. There's so much to ask about that lobbying against it because we are feeling that threat from the financial players, the traditional ones. But I've got to ask before we leave you guys, we have the benefit of having such a global audience. Is there any country that is more advanced when it comes to crypto innovation? And where does the U.S. stand in that calculus as it considers its own restrictions and regulations on the industry? Dan, do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I would say that, you know, there are a few countries like Luxembourg or Switzerland that are progressive in trying to establish a blockchain industry there. Uh, and the U.S. used to have a dramatic lead here, and we just updated some stats on our own portfolio. And in the first uh, six years, 65% of our investments were in the United States, and in the last 18 months, that's fallen to only 42%. So from a, a U.S. perspective, it'd be great to provide more clarity on regulation to encourage this obviously very important industry to develop in the United States rather than outside. Mike, where's the crypto leader in your perspective? Listen, it's a, what's interesting is crypto is global. And so Bitcoin is traded in every country in the world, right? In every village, there's someone telling the Bitcoin story. And so we don't, in general, most of our financial markets are, are local, right? The US bond market, the Europeans got its own markets, Japan has its own equity market. And so crypto really is the first global market. And so when you're working on these protocols, if it's, Uniswap, that's a decentralized exchange, you have a global audience. And so it's fascinating how fast they can grow. Um, a lot of the human capital that's building these protocols is still coming out of the US. Uh, a lot of the usage of this and a lot of the new ecosystems are showing up outside of the US and that's because of lack of clarity of regulation um, or just the fact that there is regulation. And listen, I think, Gary Gensler is going to be a great head of the SEC for crypto. Uh, it doesn't mean he's not going to regulate. He is going to regulate. I think he's going to do things that I'd do if I was there uh, to try to make the, the rules clear for people, uh, to try to look at things that feel really, really risky and say, hey, these things are really, really risky. We don't want, you know, lending companies to be 100 to 1 leverage, just like we don't right. want banks to be 100 to 1 leverage. Uh, and Mike. so... While we think about regulation also, I mean, there's also this great tension between central banking rather than regulation and, and currencies. Do you think there will be a cryptocurrency that overtakes a traditional currency? And if so, where? Listen, I think central banks all are looking at a digital version of their own currency, right? We call them stable coins or central bank issued digital currencies. With 100% certainty, I think you're going to see those out of most major central banks in the next five years. Uh, some will be, like I think in the U.S., private 
stable coins that are regulated by the Fed, where the deposits for that stable coin are held at a Fed institution. Uh, some will be centralized, like in China. And so I think you're going to see payments, a huge revolution in payments, go towards a crypto world, right? a blockchain-based world. And so you're going to see a monster revolution there. We will see more adoption of things like Bitcoin or Dogecoin, if that becomes your coin, uh, if central banks and treasuries do a, a terrible job at what they're doing. Right? right now, people in the West are buying Bitcoin not because they think we're going to become Venezuela, our currency is going to become you know, toilet paper. That's not why. Uh, they think the possibility of a slower and and fat, or I'm sorry, a faster paced debasement is going to happen, right? Dan will tell you that that a that a British yeah, pound exactly. sterling you used to get a full pound of sterling for a pound, right? Now it costs how much, Dan, to buy a pound? <laughs> it's 184. Dan, I, I pound. do want to bring you in. What yeah. do you think about this idea of crypto versus currency? Yeah, I think the thing to remember is there are already 200 currencies on Earth. Bitcoin's just number 201, right? And so I don't think it's going to replace the U.S. dollar. But like Mike said, the Venezuelan Boulevard, you know, could be replaced in our lifetimes by a cryptocurrency. You'll just see it as a complimentary payment rail. Yeah, so you know, that's the way to think about it. In some well, ways... Anyways. Crypto is a necessity in the developing markets, right? It's a luxury in the developed markets. It's a necessity in markets where you've got currencies that devalue 15, 20, 25, 30% every year. And so, you know, for the emerging markets, Bitcoin really is a human right. I'm very excited to be continuing this conversation with both of you for the years to come. Mike Novogratz of Galaxy Digital and Dan Moorhead of Pantera Capital, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Anali. Thank you. Yeah.